Incoming transmission. Good evening, everybody on the USS Kukulin. Uh, apologies, we had a little bit of a technical hiccup. Um, with Frank, the podcast, Frank, but... Frank, Frank, you're not live. Not live? You now sure? you're live. Now ah. you're live. Yeah, no, I was live. <laughs> yeah, we're having issues. But uh, hi, guys. Uh, welcome to the next EXO Chat Live. Um, uh, we're delighted to be able to say that we have an author who has written so many amazing novels for various different franchises that I'm sure you're all very fond of amongst his own uh, stories as well. Uh, and I'm very delighted to say, James Swallow, welcome to the USS Cucullin EXO Chat. Take Hello. two. Take two. Take two. I'm sure, I'm sure it's not take three at this stage or four or five. <laughs> yes, anyway, we're, we're, we are actually live now. So, um, hey, everybody, welcome. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions for Jim, um, you can put them into Facebook or in StreamYard. Just put them in the comments there. We'll keep an eye on that and pass your questions on. Uh, so, Jim, um, I had started by saying uh, you've been writing for quite some time now. I think it was when, in the 90s when you got started. Um, what was it that brought you into writing novels? Well, you know, do you, do you want me to give you like the full origin story then? Of like of like Jim the writer, it's because oh it, it yeah takes... yeah oh, sorry yeah. story time with Jim. Come with me now into the dim <laughs> and distant past of 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 wee Jim, you know, before he had a beard and and when he's you know actually had like dark hair. <laughs> um, when I I first started off, just kind of like I was uh, I was a Trek fan. I was in uh, Trek clubs and stuff like that. I was writing for fanzines. I was writing for Star Trek magazines and stuff. Star Trek fanzines and that kind of thing. Small press things. Nothing that was actually making me any money. But I kind of cut my teeth on doing that stuff. I was writing reviews and articles about the shows at the time. It was Next Generation was was breaking big. This was that kind of late 80s. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. after a while of doing that, I kind of thought, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I wonder if I could get people to pay me money for it. So gradually, I, I kind of migrated over to writing for sort of professional magazines, things like Starlog, SFX, Starburst, that kind of thing. I worked on the official Star Trek monthly magazine. Uh, and I essentially kind of parlayed my skill as a, as a Star Trek nerd into being doing it for a living. And that got me the opportunity to go over to Paramount to pitch for Star Trek. I got to sell a couple of story ideas with Star Trek Voyager. That opened the door for me to become a professional writer. And off of the back of that, I started a career. I did a little bit of script writing. I did some work in video games. But mostly I'm known for, for writing prose fiction. And what I've done is I kind of basically started off in, in fandom and I used that kind of as the stepping stone to build a career uh, and take me into becoming a professional writer. So that's kind of the potted history of how uh, I went from being a callow young fanboy to being the seasoned veteran you see before you today. So you, you've actually lived the dream then. You've, you've become like you are the fanboy who's actually gotten to do what they wish to do. I know, right? Isn't it cool? <laughs> So but, cool. Yeah, it's um yeah, I mean I'm very lucky. Um it, it's I've often said to people it's like the equivalent of winning the kind of nerd lottery. Mm -hmm. You know, the the um the, there's 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 a generation of us now, I think, people who grew up being fans of the stuff that we really love, uh yeah. who are now in a position that we've actually been able to influence those worlds to be part of it, you know, to be able to kind of create and and add a little bit of 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 our own sort of ideas to that great big tapestry. You know, I think a Star Trek is like, you imagine it like it's like a crazy quilt of ideas. It's this patchwork of, of stories and concepts, movies, books, games, comics, whatever, you know, TV shows all, all put together by different people. And it's given me so much enjoyment over the years, you know, so many entertaining stories. It's also given me a venue through which um, I've met great people and, and longtime friends, people like, you know, John yourself there, you know, you and I first met through Star Trek fandom. Yeah. Um, my wife, Mandy, we met through Star Trek fandom and so many of my friends, people I work with, colleagues, I, I still have in my life that I've met from Trek fandom from back in the day. So it's given a lot to me pro professionally and personally. So being able to say that I can add a little bit of my own self to that Star Trek universe has been it's been so rewarding. It's been, uh, you know, one of the highlights of my career. So you, you started off with... Um uh writing in the fanzines back in the 90s what were how how did you get from there specifically to so the two episodes of voyager you wrote or you wrote the premise for was one and memorial that's right right 
and I, I rewatched them today because we were going to be because uh, when he was going to be talking to you about them. So, but they were your first outlet as a writer. I didn't know that. Well, I don't. I mean, I'd done some some other stuff. I mean, I'd written sort of um, like uh, articles and things, but they were my first kind of creative writing. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. It was the first opportunity I had to sort of like, you know, invent sort of story for myself. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'd done a few short stories. I'd written sort of fan fiction and things like that, trying to cut my teeth as a writer. But it was the first time someone essentially paid me to make something up for the first time in my life, you know. Right. And generating those ideas, um, to give you an idea of how, how pitching works on Star Trek, as I often say, it's like it's the writer's equivalent of being on like the X Factor or the voice, you know, where, you know, you see those. People come up and they, they sing their little hearts out and the guy goes, no, that sucks. Off. Get off the stage. Go on, know. <laughs> it's the writer's equivalent of that. If you go, I've got this really cool idea and this happens with the crew on the ship and they do the thing and they like, no, no, we don't like that one. Do you have another idea? Okay, what about this cool idea? And you have to be able to generate these ideas and you have to, you can't be precious about them. You have to be able to sort of throw them out there one after the other and be excited and enthused about every single idea. And you also have to have a thin, thick skin because if they don't like it, you can't take it personally. Yeah. And I was out there pitching idea after idea. I would travel out to the the US kind of, you know, for, for months at a time. And I would be, you know, um, just making a living by writing articles about the shows that were in production at the time. That's how I kind of kept myself afloat. And in the meantime, I would be going to these different shows and pitching to try and sell them story ideas. And I think in, in, the, in the years I did it, I probably must have pitched, I don't know, 800 ideas maybe. Wow. Very forms. And from that, I sold two. So wow. that gives you kind of an idea of, of how how difficult it is, you know, because you would, you would get to pitch maybe four or five ideas at a time. And if you were lucky, you know, the producer or the story editor you were working with on, on that day, he would say, well, that's a great idea. You know, that's interesting. They would write it up and it would be sent upstairs to the next kind of level and if they liked it, you know, it would be sent up to the next level. And if it went through all of those levels, there was a possibility the idea would get bought. But even when that happened, there was no guarantee that me as the writer would even write the script. And that's what happened. I was right at the beginning of my career. And they said, well, this is a great idea, but we don't know you and you're not a seasoned writer. You know, you're a newbie. We're going to give this to somebody else to write. Yeah. Uh, and, we're gonna, and we're going to pay you. And, uh, you know, but someone else's name is going to be on the final product. And I, at the time... Hell, I was just happy to be there, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I was great. Oh, you're actually going to pay me? That's terrific, you know. So, so yeah, I noticed uh, Memorial. I went scrubbing through the, the credits, and on Memorial, on Voyager's episode Memorial, uh, the um, teleplay was written by somebody else, but the story was credited by Bran and Braga. That's right. Yeah. But the, the the premise was yours, so they optioned. Uh, the word is right. Yeah, they optioned. Your premise. No, well, no, no, they, they, they bought it outright. So, so it outright. Like, like an option is usually like you know they pay you to, and they might possibly use it. But with this, they they just bought me out completely. Right. Okay. So, right. so that had that was like all rights to the idea, absolutely everything. You know, um, and I was at the start, like I said, at the start of my career, I didn't have an agent. It's pretty new to it. So, um, you know, looking back on it now, I think maybe there were things I would have done differently. Um, I might have taken a different deal to try and get an on-screen credit, but at the time I was just happy to to be to be being taken seriously as a writer for the first time. Wow! And so Memorial is a, is a great example. They um, that was uh, Brannon called me up and we had like a couple of story conferences where we basically discussed what the story was going to be and how it would play out. And he put his ideas on, and I offered like you know here's how I think it should play out, and he's like, well here's what I think we should do. And then that story idea was generated by him, given to Robin Berger, who is the one who had the script assignment, and Robin was the one who who wrote the episode. So, um, you know, if you watch that episode and you enjoy it, um, Robin and Brandon are, are as much responsible for that story as I am. Um, and frankly, I have to thank them for making me look great because they took my story and they made it look awesome. <laughs> yeah, and the same thing yeah. with with um, with one as well. That was uh, Jerry Taylor, who was a producer on the show. One was Jerry Taylor's last script before she left the show uh, and went on to other things. And again, she's a fantastic writer. She did great, great work with it. And I'm just, I'm honored to have been able to work with somebody who's who's produced so much great Star Trek stories. It was, uh, the, in, in Memorial, in the end, there's that big, big obelisk 
Now, obviously yourself, uh, uh, Brandon and Robin were all into Trek. Who who came up with that? Because it's very reminiscent of uh, the Native American episode of the classic series. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, just uh, having yeah. that. Yeah, I think there was deliberately, there's, there's kind of an echo of that. I mean, but the obelisk, the, the war memorial idea, that was, um, that came from me. That was the, the original kind of genesis of memorial as a concept was this, this recurring dream I had as a kid, uh, it, where I lived, there was a big World War II war memorial on, in the middle of, the, uh, in the, middle of the, the, the roundabout near the local shopping center. Mm -hmm. And it's this very sort of dramatic kind of thing. And I was fascinated by it. And I had this recurring dream that I saw my own name etched in the side of the war memorial. Wow. And, and I just thought, you know, and it was, it was something that really struck me as a kind of bizarre concept. And so the idea of a memorial was something that you know stuck with me and i decided that you know how can i how can i use that in a science fiction idea and the idea of this this the the, the memorial being a kind of physical memory you know a, an object that is taken on like the the permanence of people remembering something that happened but the object is the kind of physicality of it how do you use that in a science fiction idea how do you the whole idea of playing with memory and that's what that story is about is our characters our voyager crew in that story they remember being in this battle, mm -hmm. which they were never in. Yeah. And it's like, well, where are these memories? Are these my memories? And I've forgotten that this happened to me. Is this somebody else's memories? How does this stuff all kind of come together? And that's the central mystery of the episode. And as the episode unfolds, you find out that it is about this memorial that is broadcasting the memories of this event. And these characters are picking up on it. Mm. Would you ever, would you ever think that uh, if you had, you know, if you had access to a producer or something in the BBC, I know you've optioned it and it's been run in Star Trek, but, you know, without the Star Trek title on it, could you do something similar in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, actually uh, World War II thing as a, you know, kind of Tales of the Unexpected World War II? Yeah, thing. It's, a, it's, a, okay. it's, that, it's that kind of idea. I do remember years back um, interviewing uh, Brad Wright, who was a producer on Stargate. Mm -hmm. and, and we were talking because Brad had pitched for, for Star Trek Next Generation uh, and Brad went off to work on, I think it was, he did The Outer Limits. Yes. The remake of that before he went on to do Stargate. And we were just having this conversation about like, oh, what, what's it like to pitch for Star Trek? And we were just talking about like our, our experiences. And he said, oh, what did you pitch for Voyager? And I told him uh, uh, the plot of Memorial. And he said, oh, we would have done that show on Stargate. Yeah, we could have done that. We could have, we could have done a Stargate version of that. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, too late. But it was, yeah, yeah. it was a very nice thing for him to say, you know. It's a great sci-fi idea, you know. Mm. It's, um, I love I love ideas like that. I love concepts that kind of play with the nature of memory and, and the nature of who you are, you know. And it's it's uh, it's interesting that Branham was the one who came on board to work on the, the the development of that because one of my favorite episodes of TNG is uh, Frame of Mind. If you remember that one. Riker, Riker, Riker doesn't know yeah. what's what, what's real, what's yeah. not real. He's in a mental institution. Yeah, you know, he's yeah. he's in a he, he's in a mental institution, and people are saying you're not really cap, you're not really a, a Starfleet officer, but he's also in this play about being in a mental institution. It's mm -hmm. like, is the play real, or is you know? And and it's like all these different layers of reality start breaking down around him, and I really love that episode. And that was written by Brannon, and yeah. and so when when I was talking to him about Memorial, I said, look, you know. I wrote this kind of story because I know that you like this kind of story, that we both had that kind of connectivity, that we liked that kind of what is the nature of reality story. And I think that, you know, he really keyed into that. And Frame, that's of why, is, Frame of Mind is also a show that you, a Star Trek episode that you could, you could actually stage that hmm. on a stage at a con or something. That'd, that'd be an interesting kind of delve into that because you know, even if it wasn't, if it, even if it didn't have Star Trek on the title or in the franchise, it's still an interesting exploration. And I think a lot of a lot of shows have done it. I think Buffy Buffy's done it, and the you know, you know, your reality is not reality. You know, and then bring those characters into our uh, less fun reality, and then tell them, well, no, you're you're dreaming a story. And then you go back into the universe by the end of the episode. But yeah, it's it's all. I, mean, I think that those those kind of stories always work with like an ongoing show, like Buffy, for example, because you know if you watch a couple of seasons of that you know those characters, and so when you see a story where someone says, "Oh, none of that is real," we as the audience know that's not true. We've yeah. been watching this for three seasons. Yeah. We know it's true. 
Uh, and so you have that kind of tension, you know, you're kind of looking at the screen going, don't listen to them. You know, he's lying to you. And the character starts to kind of crumble and you're like, oh no, and you feel really, you feel really bad for them. You feel really connected to them. And you can, you, you have to kind of, I think to make a story like that work, you have to set up the fantasy world before you can set up the not fantasy world. Yeah. Because if, you, if you have one without the other, it doesn't really play, you know? I mean, if you did a story like Frame of Mind, if it was like an episode of The Outer Limits, right? And you have a guy in a mental institution and they're saying, you're not really captain of a starship. And you'd never met that character before. You wouldn't know if that was true or not. You know, it really could be kind of a hallucination. But the fact that like in Frame of Mind, we know who Will Riker is. Yeah. We, know, we know what he is and where he, where he comes from. What, the tragedy of that story is when you see him start to down but you can't reach through the screen and say, Will, everything's going to be fine, buddy. You know, you are who you know, you know, and you see it. And, and that's the, that's the kind of, that's why it's a horror story in a way, because, you know, you see him going down towards this dark place. And of course he's, you know, he's a character we all know and love. You want him to come back. You're invested, you know, and that's why it's such a great story. Frank, did you have, uh, have yeah, no, I just want to like, wait, so, you know, you did the, uh, the, what you offered for Voyager. How did you move from there to, finding your way towards, you know, writing for other shows and getting into writing, you know, writing professionally, like novels and all that. Like, what, what was it? What was the point where you said, this was my breakthrough and this is where I can go from here? It's funny that, you know, um, it was interesting you used the word breakthrough, right? Because you think, um, what's that point where you go, oh, now I've made it, you know, now yeah. I'm a success, now I'm doing this. Uh, I've been doing this now for over 25 years. I still don't feel like I made that point yet. I don't feel like I've peaked, right? It's like, it's like, it's always, it's a series of other peaks. I'm like, oh, I did that thing. That's great. But now what's the next thing? Oh, I did that thing. Well, what's the next thing? And the next thing and the next thing, you know, because I feel like as a, as, as somebody who's invested and passionate about my work, I'm always looking for the next, the next goal, you know, the next peak to conquer. So I, you know, I, I did a TV thing and I was like, that's great. I did that. But I had the opportunity to, to, to go and live in the U S I had a friend who was, living out there at the time for a Texan friend of mine who was a comics artist. And this was, this is like the late nineties. And he said to me, you know, do you want to come and live with me for a while? Be my roommate uh, and, and seriously look at this as a career for yourself. You can live out here in Hollywood and you can, you know, pitch for these different shows, not just Star Trek, but there are other shows that, that were being put together at the time. Babylon five, dark skies, X files, all these other shows out there. The dark skies. I loved the first half of the se first. <clears throat> I only got one season, but, the first 13 episodes of that before it got extended were just, I love that. It was fantastic. Yeah. And they, they put so much work into the story Bible for that show. It was great stuff. But yeah, mm. so, um, I, and I had an opportunity and in the end, um, I didn't take it. Uh, and I decided, you know, I was, I, I was just too, I wasn't, I guess I was afraid to really to make a big leap like that, to kind of throw away everything that I had uh, and, and roll the dice. I just wasn't ready at that stage in my career. So, I went back home and I said, okay, well, if I'm not going to do this, what am I going to do? And I was doing a lot of work for magazines at the time. And then there was this kind of six month period where like five different magazines I'd worked on all shut down at once. And I've been thinking about like, oh, maybe I should try prose writing. And I was getting ready to jump. And then I got pushed because all these magazines closed down. And it's like, okay, well, now you've got to do something because otherwise yeah, you're not going to yeah. be earning any money. So this idea I had about doing some books, I was like, oh, yeah, now I really need, seriously need to think about it right now. And that was the Sundowners series. So I, I, I did this series of YA Westerns, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I pitched those, sold them, and that was the first time I'd written any sort of actual prose fiction, any actual sort of, like, you know, a, a proper novel with my name on it. And once that was done, um, I had a kind of audition item that I could take to other publishers and say, well, I, I did these books. Perhaps you'd be interested in looking at me for your book line. And that gave me an in into writing for what we call tie-in fiction, which is kind of the licensed fiction based on existing universes. So that was like the, the 2000 AD stuff, the Judge Dredd novels, the, um, the, the Warhammer fiction, all those kind of things. That gave me an opportunity there to, uh, to just, um, to, to kind of like you know find a find a different place for me to tell stories in, and uh, and from there onwards, uh, I've kind of just gone from strength to strength, you know, I'm doing a lot of. <laughs> and is it a different process, process for you um, when, when you're writing for, for say for established, established franchises and when you're creating something yourself like just on downers? Is it a different writing process for you? 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, very much so. It's um when you're when you're writing in an existing franchise, you know, it's like I, the way I equate it is it's like someone gives you a box of toys and says, "Well, would you like to play with these cool toys?" And it's like, "Yeah, that's great," but you can't break them, you can't get dirty finger marks on them, and at the end of the day, you have to put them back in the box, as you know, relatively untouched. And there's this big book of rules that you have to follow, and mm. you know, things you can do and things you can't do. And some, and you know, that might sound like a, a kind of a straitjacket for creativity, but I don't think it is. I mean, I feel like it's um, it's a spur to tell interesting stories. So. I like the opportunity to be able to kind of visit another fictional universe and say, well, let's play around there for a while. Let's take these characters on a journey and, and do some fun stuff. So you've got those challenges. But then if you're doing original stories, you don't have any of those rules. You can go wherever you like. You can do whatever you want. But that's a different set of challenges because you have you have no rules, but you have no rules, right? And it's like, where do you even start? You know, where do you begin with this story? You have the blank page yeah. in front of you. And that can be, you know, that can be terrifying because it's it's a lot of work to kind of create a world from the ground up, to create characters, to get people invested and interested in them from from absolutely zero to kind of like 100. You have to work really hard to kind of get people's interest. So it's a very different challenge. At, at the end of the day, it's all storytelling, right? It's story is story, characters are characters, and, you know, interesting narrative is good no matter where you find it. But it's the, the set of tools that you get to build your story are very different from a licensed world or an original piece of fiction. So there's, a, uh, there's a question there from uh, Anne Grayson. Oh, yeah. tell you to that. Um, so of the you know the franchises that you've written for, um, who is your favorite character? Right, and what story stayed with you the longest? That's a really hard question to answer because, um, in terms of like fictional char like um, characters, other people's characters. What have I really enjoyed writing? I really liked writing writing kind of because I'm an original series TOS Trek nerd. That's the kind of that's my first fandom. So I really did like writing Kirk Spock and McCoy, like classic Trek era, you know, in the kind of the brightly colored tunics era of Star Trek. You know, to me that feels like that's that's hundred percent pure Trek, right? I really loved writing them and going back to that and finding the voices for those characters. That was a lot of fun. In terms of the story that's kind of stayed with me the longest, um, there's a there's a short story I did for uh, a Doctor Who anthology um, called uh, the Dalek Empire Doctor Who anthology, and I did a Paul McGann Doctor story called Museum Piece, which was um, just a little bit of short fiction that I had a kind of vague idea about how it would work out, and it just everything came together in it really well. And it's one of those kind of pieces of work where I look at it and go, wow, I'm pretty good at what I do. You know, it's like I, I, I'm very, very proud of that piece. And, it, and it's come out really well. And uh, Nick Briggs, who, uh, if you know, is you know, the, the guy who's the voice of the, the dialects and also one of the senior producers over at Big Finish, who produced the Doctor Who audios. He did a really brilliant audio book reading of it, um, which is just fantastic, really kind of makes it just absolutely sing. And I'm really proud of, of how that came out. And, and that's definitely a story that sticks with me because it has a, a strong emotional punch that I think kind of just still works really, really well, even though it was like it's years have been have gone by since I wrote it. Well, and so without giving spoilers uh, too much on the story, what was the, the premise? Because Paul McGann was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he's the doctor that didn't get to really do much besides the failed American pilot, right? That's Paul McGann, oh, yeah. That's right. yeah. yeah. So, but his, Paul McGann's stories were the bridge in the kind of beta canon until Christopher Eccleston came in. So there's there's an awful lot of stories for that doctor out there that just never got televised. So but what's the premise of, of your short story to kind of give everybody an idea? Because I'm interested well, in myself. Like, what did you, uh, did you put him through? Well, the, the, the concept of it is that, um, it's it's before the time war begins and the doctor is at this point where he knows he's going to have to do something terrible and he's kind of weighing up how do i how do i square this with the kind of man that i am and so he needs to he needs to find somebody who he can have this conversation with and there's a character in the in the dalek empire audio drama series actually played by uh, the late great gareth thomas um and oh god i'm blanking on the character's name now 
He's the, the Knight of Valicia, um, Kalendorf. Kalendorf is the name of the character. And he's this, he's this old soldier, this venerable old warrior type character, uh, sort of Churchillian type figure. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who in 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 his past he fought the Daleks, and in the in the time period the story is set in, it's it's like decades later, and now he's an old man, you know, at the end of his life, but still sort of carrying the weight of of this war that happened, and and he's visiting this museum where there's this kind of hall of Daleks, and it's kind of like again inspired a little bit by the Imperial War Museum, you know, when you go in there, there's racks mm -hmm. of, of of shelving and stuff, and you see kind of you know Nazi stormtrooper uniforms and tanks and stuff, and and sometimes it's difficult to kind of look at those objects and understand the terror and the horror of what was behind them. And this is a kind of science fiction take on the same idea, you know. Mm -hmm. And and the doctor comes to see Kalendorf, who is a soldier, and says to him, I have to make this kind of soldier's choice. And I don't know, I don't know what to do. And it's the two of them having this conversation. But then something else happens, and I'm, I'm not going to spoil it. But there's something else going on in, in there's a third character in the story uh, and things kind of like spiral out of control. But it was uh, for me, it was a really interesting character piece and I really enjoyed writing it. So um, did you write that, did you write that before or after the, the reboot with Eccleston? That was no, it, I think it was shortly after it started. Yeah. So so it was when the, the, the it would probably yeah, probably would have been about the, fir the first season of the reboot. Because right. the time war stuff was all around. Because I remember I I had some very overt references to time war stuff, which they asked me to take out because they didn't want it to be too co closely connected. Right. But, okay. If you read between the lines, you know what he's talking about. So is did you did you um did you were you given uh by the by the publishing company were you given kind of like here's the bible of what we're doing for the next while with with Doctor Who or did you take that from what you'd inferred from from episodes no not really it was just you know they, they they were doing this anthology they were doing this series of anthologies the doctor who short trips anthology each one would have a theme and mm. the theme of this particular one dalek empire was to tie into this audio drama series that big finish had previously done is to pick up these different characters and do different things with them and i i had this idea i, I really liked the series and i really liked the character of kalendorf and i liked the idea of visiting him like revisiting him decades after the events of the stories like what would he become years after that and it just gradually kind of came together i, li I like the idea of the time war stuff and the missing missing elements that we had at that point we hadn't seen any of that on the tv show mm -hmm. and and i wanted to kind of pull on that thread and see where it went and it was just it was one of those things where it all came together really well it was a fun idea a great opportunity and and, and the story really worked so that's why i'm so fond of it because it's just kind of it was one of those sort of moments in my career where lightning really struck and everything came together really well so uh, there's another there's, frank there's another question there from from Anne. Anne's jumping in there it's great for questions anybody else uh, guys who's watching live I forgot, like, I mean, you were talking about uh, you know writing for characters i've just finished fear which i really oh, okay. enjoyed because i'm a, a a discovery fan but did you find writing for saru like you know and his how he was handling fear and all the experiences that he was having at that time in, in his storyline, an interesting thing to write about. I mean, it was a yeah, real yeah. strong character piece, I thought, and like in exploring. The great thing about reading is like you get to go right inside the mind of the character, you know, and that's what I really enjoyed about this book. And did you find that a fascinating thing to write about? Because I, I think I find Sarut to be a fascinating character. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you made a really great point there is the one of the cool things about doing tie-in books that you never really get to do on TV or in a movie is you get to get inside the head of the characters it's not often you do that in a film or a television show you know you you may see a character on screen and you may get an insight into what they're thinking but you don't really literally get to see things through their eyes and the great yeah. thing about prose is you can do that is you can really get into their thought processes and that was that was kind of part of the the motivation for fear itself when we were writing these books it was a year before discovery season one hit and uh, we were all signed up to these NGAs. We had like CBS ninjas watching our houses to make sure we didn't say anything. It was like none of us could could say or do anything without, you know, we had to keep everything super secret. And right, I would right. I would I would wake up in the morning and I, we were signed up to all this sort of like top secret material that we would get sent. And every morning I would, I would boot up my computer and I would have the day's photography from whatever show was being shot that day. 
So it'd be set photography from the show and new drafts of the scripts. And so I was absorbing all this new sort of discovery material as it was being made. And it was really incredible to kind of see the show coming together while I was writing this novel. And I was working very closely with Kirsten Beyer. Kirsten's formerly uh, a Star Trek novelist, done a lot of work in the Star Trek Voyager stories, carrying on the Voyager timeline after the end of the TV show. Kirsten came on board as one of the producers on Discovery and later on Star Trek Picard as well. So because she's a Italian writer and she's a script writer, she understands both worlds. So she has a, a good understanding of how a novel can open out the characters that you see on the screen. And that's kind of what we've been doing with the Discovery and, uh, and the Picard novels. And so she said to me, you know, would you like to tell a story about Saru? You know, he's this interesting character. We're doing a lot of cool stuff with him. And we built a load of backstory. You know, we originally the book was actually going to go back to Saru's home planet and we were going to show like his origin story. And we worked on loads of stuff about the Kelpian culture and, and how the nature of it all worked. Some of which did eventually make its way into the TV show, like kind of two seasons later, a lot of it we ended up changing and going in a different direction for. Um, but that was a lot of fun to kind of be, be able to sort of contribute a little something because previously as a tie-in writer, the door doesn't swing both ways. It's like the TV show or the movie says, you will write this. And you don't get to kind of push back and suggest anything. But with Discovery and with Picard, it's we've had more options to say, well, here's what we're going to do in the book. Could you maybe put something in the TV show that will make these things mesh together a little bit more closely? Wow. And so that's been a really great working relationship. So having, having that kind of unique insight into the show... Um, was really cool. And I think Saru is a really interesting character. Certainly early on when we see him as this kind of fearful, nervous guy who is trying to find his way in the world, is is a very different sort of person from what we've seen in previous Star Trek stories. A lot of Star Trek characters seem very self-assured, very confident. They've always got kind of a path in front of them and they seem to know where they're going. Whereas Saru was kind of reticent, like, you know, he's a bit prissy, he's a bit stuck up. He's got like plenty of issues and he fe feels really real. And that's what I really liked about him trying to get hold of that character and say, well, what's going on inside his head? How does how do you live if you're somebody who is genetically afraid of everything? How do you even go yeah. through life? And, and, and that was a that was a fun thing to do and explore him and, and put him in a situation in fear itself. He he kind of gets he has a kind of be careful what you wish for situation. At the beginning of the novel, he's like, well, you know, I could I could do what Michael Burnham does. I could I could be reckless and I could kind of bend the rules if I wanted to. And then he gets put in a situation where he has to do that. And and he can't because he's not Michael Burnham. He's Saru and he has to solve the problem the way that he solves it. And fear itself is about him understanding his own strengths and weaknesses and solving a problem at hand and kind of like growing and, and developing further in towards the character that we know from the TV show. Oh, I think so. And I find that once you've read a book like that and you've delved into the mind of that character, when you're watching the show afterwards, you feel as if you have you know more about what that character's thinking as the show progresses. Like, you know what I mean? Because it's almost like you, you, you're, you come to understand his thought processes from, from reading the book. Like, you that's, know? that's definitely kind of part of the hope is, is, like I say, you know, what we want to do with these books is we want to open out the characters. So if there's a character on the show that you like, we want to say, well, let's shine a light on them and spotlight something that maybe you haven't seen before or just give you a bit of insight so that, you know, you will change the way that you view that character from that point onwards because you know them better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Johnny, you were saying that. Thanks for that, James. I'm really looking forward now to Dark Bear. That's going to be my next one. Um, Anne was wondering, uh, who was your favourite writer growing up and who influenced your writings the most? Well, that's another good question. I mean... There's so many different writers out there who've who've been important to me. I mean, certainly, um, if I if I just talked about S Star Trek writers, is I, I read lots of Star Trek tie-in novels when I was younger. So uh, writers like uh, Vonda McIntyre, definitely, I would say um, Diane Duane and Peter Morwood were really big influences on me. Uh, mm. John M. Ford, who I think wrote what to me uh, the last the final reflection. To me, I have to say the best Star Trek novel ever written, in my humble opinion. You know, it's just it's um, it's 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 a, it's a TOS novel. It's about the Klingon Empire. It's actually about a novel being written 
about the Klingon Empire and it's kind of got this great framing device. It's just such a great book. It really is. And it's kind of, it's the, it's the Klingons before they became the Klingons that we know on the show now. And it takes things in a slightly different direction, but it's just so well written. And, uh, and also Diane Duane's uh, The Romulan Way is another great example of a book that really gives you a great insight into a, into a, into a, a species from Star Trek. So those kind of like, those were my favorite Trek writers. But beyond that, uh, I would say um, authors like uh, Robert Ludlum as a thriller writer was a, was a, was a sort of big favorite of mine. Uh, William Gibson, the cyberpunk author, Philip K. Dick, the guy who created Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was Blade Runner. Yeah. Uh, all of those writers, and Ian Fleming as well, the or James James Bond author. A lot of those guys were their works. I think influenced me a lot, influenced my style. And I, 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 I would read those books and then kind of go back and kind of deconstruct them and look at the structure of how they'd been written and the sort of nuance and the, the, um, the sort of pacing of them. So those writers, I think, were a very strong influence on me. And, uh, and to this day, I still, I still read their works. Occasionally, I'll, I'll go back and kind of like refresh my memory and pick up a book, read a couple of pages and end up reading the whole thing again because I enjoy it so much. Brilliant. There's another question there. Um, Anne, Anne's coming thinking fast with the questions. Uh, or should, that, that was when I, this is this is more of a fanboy question, I think. Where where did it go? Uh, it was. Oh, yeah, there it is. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What was your favorite fanboy, fanboy moment with a famous person? Oh, my favorite fanboy moment. I'm pretty lucky that um, before I started being a prose writer, one of the things I used to do is I was I, I was writing magazine articles, so um, I got to. I got to go to um, shows and see stuff being made, and I got to interview people, uh, actors and writers. Um, and one of the coolest things that I got to do was was to go on the sets of a bunch of really cool sci-fi shows. So you know, um, I've put my feet up on Fox Mulder's desk. You know, I, I've stood I've stood at the, at the command deck on Babylon Five. Oh, um, you know, I've. No. I've sat I've sat in the captain's chair of, of the Enterprise D, the Defiant, the NX01 Enterprise. But probably the nerdiest thing I ever did was one day I was doing uh, a, a set report on an episode of Star Trek Voyager, and they were shooting on the main stage on the bridge. Uh, and the, and the, the sets on Voyager is like the, they, were, they were two separate sort of compartments with a corridor in between. So you would have like the bridge. I think it was like main engineering was on one set, one, one, one area. The other area had the bridge and the corridor and, and the sick bay and that kind of stuff. But they were all in the same power setting. So if you were shooting on one, the lights would be on in the other because they cool. couldn't turn one off. And uh, so they all left the bridge and they went to do a scene on the, on the, on the, uh, in the warp core in the engine, main engineering. And they left me on the bridge of, the, of Voyager on my own. <laughs> Un unsupervised <laughs> so you tried every seat obviously i was way too professional to do that john you know <laughs> absolutely you know far too professional. i did not sit in tom paris's chair and pretend i was flying voyager right i did <laughs> not i did not go to tuvok seat and go captain we appear to be detecting a subspace anomaly i did not <laughs> Sit in Janeway's chair and do the Captain Kirk pose and uh, engage. I didn't. I didn't do any any of those things at all. Absolutely not. <laughs> hey, don't they have CCTV in these locations? <laughs> I mean, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if. I wonder if, like you know, at the end of the year when they were having the cast rap party, they were like, "Hey, let's watch that video of the English guy on the bridge again." <laughs> and then they, you know, oh, episode yeah. of Star Trek. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. And he's the, the, and he's like, because the, the amazing thing about um, the sets of the Star Trek show sets is they spent so much money on them. They were really high quality, and uh -huh. you know you could you could sit down on a set and there were no there's no kind of bits of the room that were missing. So all you would see around you was this complete enveloped space. So it was like being, you know, it's like you, it's like you're really being there. You know, you really feels like you're on the bridge of on the bridge of a starship. So when you, were there, did, 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 when you were there, uh, and you, you know, you were not sitting at uh, the con. <laughs> and you looked out. Were you looking out at the studio wall, or did they have the blue screen up? No, they had the they had like the 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 the, the main viewer kind of was on like wheels, so it would be wheeled in or wheeled out. Wow. And they had a position because if you um 
if you watch Voyager, right above like the captain's chair, there's this like yeah. little white dome, mm -hmm. and it has uh, a rail around it. And the clever thing about it is, is it's built into the set, but it's actually designed that they could clip cameras to it. Right. So, right. So they could attach a camera, so it would be pointing down at like Janeway or or um, or uh, two uh, Chakotay's kind of seat, you know. And so, you know, there could be those moments where the, the, the bridge was like this entire sort of theater in the round kind of thing. It's an enclosed yeah, space. Yeah. And uh, and it was just incredible to, to sort of sit there and, and, and this whole thing lit up, you know, with all the lights sort of blinking. You know, there's that there's that episode of TOS, uh, Mark of Gideon, where Kirk wakes up on the Enterprise and the ship is completely deserted. And he walks around the bridge. And I felt like that. Just I felt like I was I was on Voyager. <laughs> in my own episode of the show where the crew had gone missing and it was, oh, well, it's up to me to fly the ship now. Okay, then. <laughs> what, what, what a feeling. I mean, wow. So that's, that's interesting. Like, so you, you, well, you had an official reason to be there. Um, and I've said it before, one of the problems that I, I get worried about is being, is being a fanboy and we're, wor and working in the industry. And cause there was that time, uh, back in on the next generation and i'm sure by you know attending the cons and stuff in the past you've seen it and you can find it up on youtube there was those there was the uh, there was the ad and the extra that broke in to the next generation uh thing um sets one night and with an old hi8 camcorder videoed themselves going around with the lights off and they went into the uh, sick bay and broke the bio bed Ooh. Have you ever seen that video? No, God. Huh? Oh, Did they get fired? Oh, yeah. There was a, oh, as far as I hear, there was a scandal where they then, um, they then after that, had a bit of a policy of being very wary of uh, hiring fans hmm. to do any sort of jobs on the show. So, like, if you had a hint of being a fan towards or being any sort of convention goer, even though you may be good at your job, you may not have gotten on past, you know, the CV element of it, but this is way back in before the days of the internet. So this is where you'd smuggle out the tape and it'd appear at some sort of convention or so, some sort, you know. But uh, I've seen that video and we've shown it at one of our uh, captains' dinners as well. And yeah, it is kind of like they 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 try and lie on the bio bed, but of course the bio bed was had to be bolted to the ground because of the shape of the leg. It was a single mono mono leg thing, but it needed to be bolted. It wasn't bolted to the ground. So your man gets up on it and it falls over and then they just run away. Uh, it, man, just run. <laughs> That's great. Oh. So, um, you know, it keeps getting taken down, but I'm sure you can find it on YouTube somewhere. Someone's got it up there uh, buried, you know? So, but yeah, that was, I, I always get worried, you know, about appearing on, on doing this in this type of, thing uh, for the crew because I actually work myself in the industry and sometimes get worried about oh why didn't I get that job is it because they know uh, <laughs> I think these days though that um, I, I think it's true now that you, you look at a lot of the people especially with Trek is a perfectly good example you look mm -hmm. at the people who are working on the show and a good 50 to 70 percent of them are people who love Star Trek that's right yeah. uh, people, you know people who have come up through the ranks as it were you know who have gone to conventions who have who have done different stuff, um, you know, who have, have done cosplay, and then they're like, oh, now I'm doing it for a living, you know. And I think that's really great. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. I was looking at a thing recently. Um, the is it? I'm trying to remember the actor's name. Paul Paul Young, the the guy who plays the dad in Kim's Convenience, who is the oh yes, yeah. yeah, 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 one of the X-wing pilots on the Mandalorian. That's right. And you know, and he was talking about how you know how getting to be in a Star Wars TV show. And he's a massive Star Wars fan. And you look at his like his own YouTube channel as well. Yeah, and you look at his like Instagram, and it's like pictures and pages and pages of him in various different cosplay uniforms. You know, he's a Trek fan as well. You know, he's yeah. dressed up as a Starfleet officer or Imperial officer or this that you know, X wing pilot. You know, and then um, and then he's playing an X wing pilot on TV, and it's like, man, you're living the dream, right? It's just awesome. Yeah. That's wow. it's amazing. Antoinette's mentioned uh, my current favorite book. Now I've not finished it um you know that's how far through it i am good Very you know, so, um yeah and I'm, you know and I'm, i am enjoying it and it's a it's a nice like it does tie in it ties in great to uh to picard and i remember when we spoke at destination star trek that you know you kind of you had to go you know i'm working on a thing um you know and you had seen all the episodes at this point 
long before they'd come out, you know, because it wasn't going to come out here until January. So, um, but I'm, you know, I always like to point out to people that, uh, you know, my favorite page in the book is, um, you know, page 33, where, you know, that's where I appear. So, <laughs> I like doing that. Is, is, is that, that said, uh, you know, um, in, in the past, in previous Star Trek novels, um, because Quite. you have a lot of different. You have a lot of different characters turning up as bridge crew people. Occasionally, you have like Ensign so and so, and I have like Ensign Blank, right? I'm like, I've got to come up with a name for this. Mm. So I just started putting in the names of people that I know, because especially people who are friends of mine who are Trek fans. A couple of times, I've even done it at uh, events for like a charity auction. It's like you know, if you you bid some money for charity, uh, I'll write you in as a red shirt who gets horribly maimed in in, in a story or something like that. And and so that was fun to do. And uh, yeah, and so John, you know, you and I were talking about this, and I was like, "You want to, you want to be us in a in a Star Trek novel?" And it's like, yeah, and I think you were like, oh, "Is he just pulling my leg?" And I'm like, oh, you, know, <laughs> you know, and then and then I was writing the scene. I was like, "Well, I need a new security officer for this." I was like, "Who do I know who could do that?" Hmm, I know, I know, a strapping young fellow. <laughs> I know, right. and uh, and so you know, it was it was fun to do that. You know, it's 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 always nice as a it's like a little gift for my friends, and it's also cool for people who. You know, people who know you go, is that? And yes, it is. That is him. Yeah. yeah. And it, I, I, what I like is what, and I, you know, when, when, uh, when I got the book and I, I read it, you know, uh, I read that moment and I was like, oh, I'm the security, I'm the chief of security on the Titan. This is amazing. So that's why I had to go and get the actual, you know, yeah. Specific, I, saying, I'm in costume <laughs> as, as me, you know, yeah. for Beta Quanon. So this, that, that was like so much thank you. Everyone go buy the book. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> but that's great to see now because now you can cosplay as you, right? Yes, <laughs> officially. And it's like, you know, no one can tell you that's wrong. No, this is the best version of this costume because yeah. I am. If, it, is it, if it's you, are you really cosplaying? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is, you know, whoa, this is just going into the mind of it now. Are we going into this is the frame yeah. of mind? I'm gonna to have to write. We're gonna to have to write my. I'm gonna to have to write my own fanfic about my own character. Yeah, absolutely. You should totally do that. That's a great idea. Well, so, so so you've already created a conundrum um, for for me and the crew of the Kukulans. So uh, the Dark Veil vale is set in twenty twenty three eighty six, right? It's just a, that's, that's yeah, it's just a year after after the Mars disaster, and yeah. it's set on the Titan and uh, dealing with. I'm, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm only halfway through it myself, but it is dealing with stuff that is really uh, at the heart of the Picard storyline. So uh, it's really cool, and it deals with um, the family of uh, Riker and Troy and and their first child, um, which is a question I'm going to ask you in a moment. Um, but I know. So if when we play, we play, uh, we spoke to Una McCormick as well, um, who wrote the autobiography, and she gave the ship a mention in her book, which we were uh, after that conversation we had uh, uh, when you were signing at the uh, the FP. Uh, um, booth and uh, so the Kukulan got a mention in her autobiography of Catherine Janeway, which was amazing. And from that, uh, we've started a new kind of uh, lockdown series where we play Star Trek Adventures. And from our one little mention in Una's book, I've taken the character she sent us, the the uh, the fictional character Flora Christopher. We've taken her from the Albatani to uh, the Kukulan. And she gave us a mission as well. So we, I've created this game that we're playing called Star Trek Kukulin, Um and it's based in twenty. What is it? Twenty three sixty four. It's like season three of the Next Generation, where I've expanded on that mission that is just mentioned in one line on page seventy four of her book with Lieutenant Christopher, and I've expanded this this storyline on a on a, a downed Bajoran ship on a on a planet, and I've made it Felina too. Um, you know, so I've expanded that type of thing. So what that leaves us with is in 2364, I'm a commander on board the USS Kukulin. But in the future, you've put me on the Titan in 2386, uh, 60, 20 years later, and I've done something. I've done something wrong because I've been demoted one pip. So I've gone from commander to then a commander. So there's a well, story. Do. Here. What did I do? Well, obviously... <laughs> Obviously, what happens here, and of course, you haven't aged either. No, so no. What happens there is, is um, you know, the, at some point in the in the not foreseeable future, there's going to be 
uh, an incident involving you in the Department of Temporal Investigations. <laughs> yes. Where, where you are going to be involved in uh, slingshotting a ship around the sun and there'll be some sort of bizarre temporal shenanigans where mm. you will obviously do something noble and heroic, uh, but but against orders, and they'll be like, ah, Mr. East, you know, you you saved you saved that ship full of Bajoran orphans. Good job from being sucked into a time warp. But I'm afraid you you didn't follow Starfleet protocol, so you're being demoted. Oh, and and you and by the way, you've been stuck in a time warp for 20 years. That's why you haven't aged. <laughs> there you go, guys. You impressed uh, you impressed Captain William Riker, who would like you to join his crew. So there you go, so, guys. So there, there's yeah. there's some ex extended. Uh, what do we call that? Yeah, alpha, beta, gamma, or um, Charlie. So there's there's not so quite beta canon of of, of why why I ended up on the on the Titan uh, demoted. Um, I wouldn't expect. Like, it could be like he could be like your transporter clone, like Riker had, right? So he could be like a younger version. Yeah, yeah, we got stuck in the matrix for a buffer or something. It's a it's an alternate reality version of you, you know, that, that's come yeah. from a, t a different time zone. Fallen through the fallen through from the Kelvin timeline or something like that. It could be anything. It could be anything. This sounds, this sounds like a trailer for your next book, James. I reckon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the next. I think James' next uh, next book should be set uh, on on the USS Kukulin and uh, you know whatever the tie in uh, Kukulin comes along and and helps out with the entire crew. Yeah, but even like you know, uh, I've been looking at the the list of shows that, that you've written for, like you know, Stargate, Doctor Who, BattleTech, Blake Seven, one of my absolute favorites. And I'm looking forward to checking out that audio drama. I didn't even know that existed, so I'm going to definitely check that out. But I was wondering, is there any particular show that you haven't written for that you would love to? Oh, yeah. Um, the thing about being a writer and a fanboy is you can't help but look at something that you like and go, wow, that was a really cool show. Hmm, I wonder what would happen if the characters did this thing or this thing, you know? So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different... Um, franchises ips whatever you want to call it that i would love to try my hand at um i would love to do a star wars novel because i'm kind of a child of the star wars generation you know um mm. and although i've worked on um some star wars magazines and i worked on a star wars video game uh doing a star wars novel i think would be fun just to kind of have have a little fun in the galaxy far far away that would be cool i would i would love to write uh, a firefly story because, you know, talking about the sundown and stuff and steampunk and westerns, you know, again, that's definitely inside my wheelhouse. And I think that's yeah. a fun universe to explore. I've been lucky enough to do almost all of the Star Treks. I'd like to kind of collect the set. I'd like to do a story <laughs> in every Star Trek universe. So you which know? one have you not done? So I haven't done, I haven't done an Enterprise story. I haven't done a Kelvin timeline story. And I haven't done, uh, what, well, Lower Decks, I guess. So I think, is that all of them? Yeah. So if I could tell a story for, for each one of those groups of characters, I could kind of tick all of the boxes and say, I've done all of the different Star Treks. That would be kind of cool. That would. And of course, now you've got on top of that Strange New Worlds. And Prodigy as well. Yeah, of course. You've got Prodigy, two more yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully yeah. Section 21 as well. So there's lots more to, to look at there, definitely. <laughs> just, just just to go back, Frank mentioned, uh, and I remember this, uh, look, God, it must be about 16, 17 years ago. I remember we were chatting in a thistle, the Heathrow Fridge, uh, at, at one of the events in the bar. And uh, you were, I, I can't remember exactly the year. It was like 2003 or four, something like that. Maybe it was 2002. But you had just gotten the Blake 7 uh, audio play. You were, you were working on it at the time, and it was the same. It was the usual thing, where it's like, I've got this really cool gig. I can't tell you the storyline, but I, you know, I'm working on the Blake 7 thing. And uh, I believe at the time, um, now my memory could be wrong, but I think it's cool. Whatever I've come up with in the last 17 years is cool in my mind, and I, it sparked from talking with you. But Blake 7... Um, you were writing the audio play, but I think Sky were sniffing around and making a miniseries. Was that right? Yeah, it was. Um, at the time we were developing, it was going to be. It was a reboot, so mm -hmm. um, we were we were essentially following kind of in the footsteps of what Ron Moore did with Battlestar Galactica. So we were going to take the the essential core concepts of the show, the characters you're familiar with, but but give it a remix and give it a reboot and just generate a kind of newer version of the show for for a more modern era and the tv stuff was in development but at the same time we were working on 
We had an audio drama version of it that we did. We had an animated series take on it. We had all these different kind of streams mm -hmm. of how we were kind of trying to approach and kind of exploit the concept. And it's like, whichever one of these is the one that kind of hits right would be the one that we did. And, and for a while, the, the, the TV show, yeah, you were right. There was Sky and the Sci-Fi Channel. We're looking at developing that. Um, but like so many of these things, you know, it kind of ended up in turnaround and eventually it just kind of faded away. It was a great shame, really, because I think we right. had some really cool ideas. And and Blake, I do remember, I do, I do remember, sorry, um, but one of the, the, the thing that sticks out in my head, uh, I, I'd say obviously, which would be the type of mind that you have, you'd remember as well. But it was the rediscover, there was a, the discovery of the ship itself. Do you, yeah. do you remember? Can you, yeah, we, is that something you want to hold on to, or is it something you can describe right now? Uh, I mean, that was yeah. We, there was some there were some changes in the the idea of the background. Is I think the I think in the original draft the idea was going to be that the Liberator was going to be found on Earth uh, under the ice in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So it, it, rather than kind of like the the crew going out in the space, is there was going to be a sort of different take on it. And there was there was a very cool scene that was storyboarded, which is like the Liberator kind of taking off from out underneath the ice. Kind of like this, this sort of twisted shape of like this wrecked starship that looks like kind of, you know, this this kind of weird helix, like DNA helix of metal, and then it would transform slowly into the recognizable shape of of what we saw, you know, the, the you know the, the that silhouette of the of the Liberator, you know, with the the central spindle and the sphere. I always mm. think of it like like a cathedral flying through space, right? It's got that beautiful, elegant look to it, and the idea is the ship would transform into that, and that would be like kind of that would be one of your amazing sort of episode endings. Um, and it's such a great shame. We storyboarded that as well. It would have been so cool to see that on TV, but it's the way these things go. And so where, where is those stories? Um, are they buried their IP for Sky, I, Sci-Fi Channel, something that I, can... honestly, I honestly don't know. I mean, the we worked on, we ended up uh, producing the audio drama series because that was the thing that we could do straight away, that we didn't have to wait for a production company. We, we just went ahead and worked on that. And we did three episodes of that. We were going to do nine episodes, three seasons of three. We, we wrote and produced the first three. We wrote the second three. And we were working on the outlines for the, the third trilogy when essentially the plug got pulled on that. So, again, we never got to explore the story all the way to the end, which was kind of a shame, you know. Yeah. But as to where the rights are now and who owns them, your guess is as good as mine. Right. Yeah, and it's just such a, such a pity when something that you work on like that and you put so much time and effort into it and, you know, you, you're kind of like, well, that was because, I, I, you know, it's it's 16 years later and I still have that visual that you the, of the description of you, you know, that of, this, of the cathedral of the, the I think what you were, you were saying to me at the time was you were going for, you didn't know it was the Liberator as it yeah. started to rise. And it wasn't until it got into orbit and into space that it actually started to move and collect and the you know the central section with three engine pods or whatever they are those cones you know start to coalesce and then you oh 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 this is the liberator because obviously if you're watching the show you don't know that's the liberator until it actually f finalizes that form and i could have just imagined that it it would go vertically and then the camera would just oh. rotate as it would go for the engines to and then it would go into yeah. that horizontal form, you know? So I, that, that imagery stuck with me for, for the last. To be, you know, a real kind of one of those wow moments, you know, is I think of, of, of scenes in uh, sci-fi movies where, you know, you see the, the, that kind of hero shot reveal. Like there's, there's a great one in the 2009 Star Trek movie where the Enterprise comes up out of the atmosphere of Titan mm. and the ship kind of turns and it's trailing smoke behind it, and it just looks gorgeous. You know, or the, right. the the motion picture reveal of the Enterprise in the in the first Star Trek movie. You know, stuff like mm. that. Um, some, you know, it, some of those. He repeated that again in, in in Star Trek Beyond, where they're under the water, and you know, yeah. and the Enterprise finally comes up. You know, it's you know, it's not a submarine. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah great iconic images are are pretty cool. Um, you've you've um. So you've written there's so many things like you, you know you've written for the Stargate Atlantis, and I still have to find it, but I believe that uh, I, like I was so excited I, I mentioned that there's not this one, but there's another Atla uh, uh, Stargate book that you put me in, um, which were 20 years ago, which was great. Um, I was 
on the midway station between galaxies stuck there and you needed someone to walk down a corridor with uh shepherd just to do some exposition um so you put me in that do you mean to say that our, our realities are going to come crashing down because you're in so many different realities this, well as jim says this is the great thing that jim does he, he puts his friends in, into things he knows they love there's another one of jim's Jim's uh, book that was a series. Um, you followed Una and, and her story. I mean, that's that's a question. So when you write something like this, this is the this is the the series, The Fall. Um, Una wrote the book beforehand, um, and there's four of them, and you wrote the fourth one. So there's Revelation and Dust, The Crimson Shadow, um, and A Ceremony of Losses. Do you have to read those other three books before you can sit down and write your? No, we, were, we were writing, them. and there is actually there's actually five because there's a book that follows mine as well. There's Dayton Ward's right. novel that comes after after uh, Poison Chalice. Yeah. So we were all write, we were all writing them at the same time um, because Una is like super quick and very very efficient. She was writing book two, and she had book two finished before the rest of us had done any of the work on the other books. <laughs> So she was like, I'm done, you guys. She's like kind of, you know, she's out on the veranda, you know, with port and cigars while the rest of us are still writing. She's already finished, right? Um, and uh, But it, it was kind of like, I think she actually coined this, the, she described it this way, and I think it's a really good way of putting it. She said the, the fall was like a, like a relay race where the story was the baton. Um, and it's like every, you know, you'd run your bit and you hand your baton to the next runner, the next writer, and they would carry the story on. Mm. And, and I think the the thing that all of us did with that series is nobody wanted to be the one who let the side down, you know, because right. we were we were working with a team of really talented writers. Everybody brings their A game to that, so we all worked really hard and we all kind of raised our raised our game to try and keep up with everybody else. And, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, I was I was following on from a book written by David Mack, mm -hmm. and then I I like hand it off. So Dave hands me his story. And then I handed my story off to Dayton Ward, and Dayton, Dayton had the uh, had the dubious honor of being the kind of tail end Charlie. He has the guy who had to kind of tie everything up. And I can remember at the end when I sent him my manuscript, I said, "Here's the bag of dirty laundry for you. <laughs> Here you go, buddy. See ya. You know, wouldn't want to be ya." And it's like you know, but we would we would, uh, and we would do that. We would chuck stuff into our story for the next guy to kind of figure it out. It's like there you go. There's give you a little bit of work right there. But we we got such a it's, it's a great camaraderie a really kind of collegiate kind of feel amongst all of the Trek writers there, um, and uh, so working on the fall was really fun because it's it's a big epic event in the Star Trek universe. It's the kind of shot heard round the galaxy. It begins with the assassination of the president of the United Federation of Planets, and you know it's this big political conspiracy that unfolds. It has multiple layers, draws in the Cardassians, draws in Starfleet has all these different ramifications. And across all of these novels, we explore who's really behind this, what's really going on. Uh, and we bring in all the different crews and everybody gets a kind of different viewpoint and it builds into this kind of epic kind of mini series. So it was a really fun project to work on um, just to team up and work with such a great team of talented writers. Wow, I mean, so so what you're saying is you can't just read the Poison Chalice; you have to go and buy the entire set. Of yeah, that. pretty much. I mean, it's yeah. uh, Poison Chalice is is a it's a Titan story, and we were doing an ongoing series of Titan novels, so mm. it, it does connect to that. So, um, I think if you if you just read the Titan books, you could maybe you could pick it up and you could read it, right. but really, you're not going to get the full impetus of the story unless you read them all. Right. So it's a it's a it's a big one. Have you another uh, any more questions there, Frank? Are we going to move on to another series? Yeah, well, I want to like I mean, you know, speaking of all the uh, franchise stuff that James has done, but of his own novels, there he he was we were speaking here before the system crashed about the his first run of novels, the Sundowners, uh, which I understand is a um, a western. It, it's a steampunk style western. And as you know, and I love westerns myself. So you know, because I don't think anybody heard us the first time around. I was wondering if James would tell us a little bit more how he, how that story developed and where he took it along. Okay, well, I mean, um, as I said earlier on when I was talking about kind of the beginning of my my writing career, the, um, I'd been writing as a as a magazine a journalist, writing features and articles for for small press for small press and and sort of sci fi magazines. But I was looking for an opportunity to to find a way to tell a prose story, and um, as as it was, one magazine I was working for, I, uh, I was given some some young adult books to review, and I won't name names, but they were dire. 
And I really <laughs> didn't like them. And I just thought they were really derivative. And they, they, it was like almost insultingly bad. And I said, like, this is not very good. This is somebody who's just phoned this in. And they thought, oh, I could just knock off a story. And, you know, it's just for kids. Who cares? And, it, and I, I, I really felt like they were disrespecting the readership. And uh, there was a, a an editor I was working with. And he said to me, well, look, if you think you can do better, why don't you? You know, put your money where your mouth is if you think you could write better than that guy. And so I thought, you know what? Yeah, maybe I will. And I had a story idea I, I'd been sitting on for a while. So I pitched it to this publisher uh, and they liked it enough. And they said, that's great. Come in and write for us. So that was the uh, initial concept for the Sundowners series, which was four short sort of novella length books, kind of a mini series of stories all, uh, about a, a young gunslinger and a, a Native American shaman basically fighting uh, this, this uh, robber baron character who has all this kind of steampunk tech uh, and there's a, a there's a kind of science fiction element in there as well, kind of UFO crash at Roswell, but sort of in the in the 1880s. And these four novels kind of build together into one narrative with all these characters sort of fighting their way across the New West uh, and just getting engaged in sort of uh, fun hijinks and action and adventure. And for me, it was uh, it was a lot of fun to write that because I love westerns. Uh -huh. I used to I remember growing up as a kid, like Sunday lunchtime, right? Is it would be like Sunday roast on the table turn on the BBC and there's a Western and it would be like, you know, Sunday dinner watching the sons of Katie elder or something, or, you know, um, you know, the searchers or what have you, all these great Western movies. So my, my love of that kind of connected to like um, the, the sort of the Raiders of the lost Ark style pulp action adventure storytelling that expressed itself uh, in Sundowners. And I wrote that series, but I had the uh, unfortunate, unfortunate situation where I was writing a series of young adult books about the same time that the Harry Potter novels were breaking big. And for me and a, a, a whole bunch of other YA authors, it was kind of a bloodbath because the, the, oh, the Potter right. books were just the biggest and the most popular ones. And so uh, a lot of series really didn't kind of make it out of there alive. Uh, and one of them was Sundowners. But after the, the, the series finished after the fourth book, I then had books that I could sort of show as an audition piece I could take to other publishers and say, well, you know, I wrote these, I'm a proven quantity, you know, can I write for your book line? And I kind of took it from there. I still have a lot of love for them. Um, I mean, it's this year, this month actually, is the 20th anniversary of their first publication. Wow. I do have the rights wow. back. So maybe one day I might find another place for them. Uh, I think they, they, they've they aged a bit. I'd, I'd have to rework them a little bit for the kind of contemporary marketplace, but maybe one day, they might see the light of day again. That's brilliant. And, and so, you know, moving on 18 years later. So you, you now I didn't get through it myself, but uh, I did, you know, in support. I, um, thank you very much. Series. So this is, this is a departure from your usual science fiction uh, or even, you know, so like even Sundowners was still a little bit steampunk, still a bit of UFO in there. But this this is a spy thriller. This is this is really a different tack for you. And there's a whole there's five in the series. Yeah, the sixth book will be coming out at the end of the year. Yeah. So you see, yeah, another one coming out. And and I tell you what, like there you have just you know judging a book by its cover and size. This is the first one, right? Okay, and it's a certain size. You can see the size of it. You know, um, picked that up in an airport as I was traveling. And that was the first book. But then the second book, Exile, you know. It's so much more in there for your second one. And you've got, you know, so there's Exile, Ghost, Shadow, Rogue, and then your new one coming out. This isn't, this is an, this is really an epic. So, I mean, my thing is, you know, when did you come up with this? I know you did a lot of traveling as well, a lot of sitting in coffee shops to, to kind of get inspired. Um, you know, a lot of your uh, advances went to that, you know, and that's, that's an epic journey on its own just to kind of be in that place and then, you know, visualize it in your head as you're sitting there drinking a coffee and making notes in your notebook. But there's, like, I haven't gotten through them, um, you know, and I kind of feel bad for that, but you so much of a story to write. How did you have so much in your head for this, for this series, you know, to, for it to come out and what made you want to depart from, from so far? Well, I, I find as, 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 as somebody who's doing writing stuff for a career, every kind of five or 10 years, I start to get a little bit twitchy 
and I and I and I wonder, I worry that I'm kind of getting in a rut. So every now and then I look at my career and go, well, what haven't I done for a while? Is there something I haven't tried? Is there is there something I could be better at? Is there something I can do to push myself out of my comfort zone? And I'd been writing tie-in books for quite a while. This was around about 2016. And I'd been kicking around some ideas about doing something that was mine, that was 100% me. It was an original novel that I would write, that I would create from the ground up. And I thought, that's something I haven't done. I hadn't done it since Sundowners. So I started thinking about ideas. And I had a few ideas about a sci-fi thing. And I had these other ideas about doing a kind of contemporary action thriller, something in the kind of the sort of Casino Royale, Jason Bourne, Mission Impossible kind of wheelhouse, because mm -hmm. I love those movies. As much as I love science fiction, my, my kind of second love is high, high octane action thrillers. So I love both of those kind of things. And I thought that's, I could, I thought I could write a story in that world that doesn't have phases and transporters and starships, you know, that, that is kind of hackers and spies and, and uh, you know, and Ferraris and, and sort of sexy locations. And I thought, yeah, I love all that kind of stuff. I could do something in that. But it was far enough away from what I was comfortable with that I had to work at it. So I thought, I'll just try this. I'll just see if I can do it. And over the course of about two years, in between writing other projects, I was doing a little here and a little there, gradually putting it together. And then finally, I got I got Nomad written. And originally, Nomad was like, like I think, about 50,000 words longer than that version that you have in your hand there. It was like 180,000 yeah. words, nearly a 200,000 word book um, because I put so much stuff in it. I, I didn't leave anything on the bench. You know, it's all on the field. Mm. It's all in the book. And um, I couldn't sell it. I could not get arrested. And I was going to different agents and publishers and they were all saying the same thing to me. They were like, well, you're a sci-fi guy. Why are you doing, go and do a sci-fi thing. And I said, well, I, I don't want to do a sci-fi thing because I know I can do that. Mm. I want to see. I want to yeah. see if I can do this. I want to see if I can, I can go somewhere else with my writing. Try something different. And it was very, very difficult. I spent a year kind of in the wilderness, failing to sell Nomad, going to publisher after publisher. I remember um, <laughs> one conversation that that came to mind is, is a guy said to me, "Could you could you make it kind of more intersectional? Could you could you kind of put some fantasy or sci-fi in it?" I said, what do you mean? So, said, well, you know, could you put some science fiction elements, some fantasy elements in this? And I said, what do you mean? Like, if I make my lead spy, if I make him a werewolf, would you buy the book? And without even hesitation, the guy went, absolutely. <laughs> and I can remember being, I went to this meeting with this guy. I remember being on the train on the way home, staring out of the window. Bear in mind, it's been a year, and, and I haven't sold this book. And I'm going, maybe, maybe I could make him a werewolf. Maybe, maybe I could do that. And I was just, snap out of it, Jim, you idiot. You know, and I just thought, what am I doing? I can't, I don't want to be the guy. I mean, not that that's not a bad idea, actually, right? You know, as I said like the, to a friend of mine, I said, it's the born lycanthropy, right? Jason Bourne is a werewolf, right? That's not actually a bad idea for a story, but that's not the story I wanted to write. And right. I figured, okay, I'm just going to write, I'm going to sell, I'm either going to sell this book or I'm not going to sell it. And it's going to be what it's going to be. And if it doesn't work, I'll go back to doing sci-fi, but I didn't want to kind of compromise on what it was I wanted to do. I didn't want to compromise on my idea, which was this contemporary spy thriller. And then as luck would have it, I was talking to an editor, a friend of mine who had a conversation with a, uh, a an agent and that agent said, Oh, I'm looking for a book like this. And he said, well, you should look at Jim because he's written this book and he can't sell it and he needs someone to, to take him under his wing. And I went into a meeting with this agent who is a, a chap who is now my agent and um, I kind of dived out of the sun like a kamikaze pilot and just like, you know, just said to, gave this guy the most like intense sort of pitch possible about why this was the best book he's ever going to read. Because I thought I've got nothing to lose because everybody had closed the door in my face previously. And at the end of it, I remember he was kind of blown back in his chair and he said, wow, you're really passionate about this. I was like, yes, absolutely, I am. And I said, look, here's the book. Just read it if you don't like it. You don't like it. And then uh, that was like a Friday. And he called me on the Monday and he went, this is great. Let's do business. Brilliant. And he signed me up. And the rest is history. And uh, and, the, and, the, and the Mark Dane series, that's that Mark Dane's the name of the, the, the character in these okay. books. Yeah. These books have done, they've done, they've introduced me to a, a whole new audience. Uh, what's great is a lot of my kind of loyal audience from my Warhammer and Star Trek books 
have come across to read these and have really enjoyed them. And their support has been really important to me. And I really appreciate that. But I've also found myself a brand new audience of people who don't read sci-fi, but who kind of enjoy spy thrillers. And well, those I, people. I, 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 did, I did go, I did get through like the first couple of chapters, you know, the opening of the book and I, you know, the opening scenes in this book, you know, where it all goes wrong for, for Mark, it's uh I remember, like I, you know, if I ever had the chance to make a promo for a series, you know, that opening chapter just lends itself to the type of modern TV and style that's out there. I mean, you did capture the born identity and that type of situation in that. And yeah. and, and like uh, Antoinette mentioned here earlier on, you know, uh, she's reading the Dark Veil, so descriptive, it's like watching an episode. You know, and it, it's the same, like you, so you have a, an extremely visual style because like the rest of us, you've watched so many things. So you, you describe as we would see it watching it on the TV. So, I mean, it, that, that, these are hopefully someday someone will buy or option these for, for, for movies. Fingers crossed, right? yeah. Because I think, you know, Netflix you, has so many, so much shite out there. <laughs> this would be a hundred times better than anything, than a lot of the sto shows that I just skip over, you know, sw swipe well, left. I mean, for those who, who don't know the those novels so far, what type of character then is is Mark Dane? Is he like... Let me just, sorry, let's just pull that back there. Um, well, so... Let me get that. There we get that. Um, so I was inspired by... A lot of the kind of thrillers that I read when I was younger, the, the, what I always think of as like the kind of the big, the airport novels or the beach read novels, you know, the ones where there's like, it's high octane, action packed, lots of cool stuff happening. But the thing I kept finding was every hero in these books, they were all kind of these bulletproof guys. You know, they were all sort of um, Teflon coated. They would, they would get into dangerous situations, but you would never kind of think, oh, he's not going to get out of that. They would, you know, it's it's like I always say. There's the, the the three JBs, right? You got James Bond, Jack Bauer, Jason Bourne. And every <laughs> kind of action hero kind of fits into one of those categories. You know, the your James Bond guy is he's suave, sophisticated. You know, he can charm the pants off anybody. He's got a nice suit and a Ferrari, right? Your Jason Bourne guy is very cold, clinical. And kind of go. Jack Bauer is the guy who kind of kicks down the door and beats the guy to a pulp, you know, smack, slams his head in the fridge until he tells him what he wants to know, right? And and all these all the heroes we enjoy kind of tend to fall into one of those categories. And as much as I love all of those characters, I wanted to write about somebody who was not the toughest guy in the room, you know, not the best shot, not the suavest guy, but somebody who kind of has to run to keep up a little bit. A little bit more like us, real people, right? And I was inspired kind of a little bit by, um, I would say Indiana Jones is a good example of somebody who he's a hero uh, and he's smart, but he's fallible and he screws up a lot of the time, but he still has a good heart and he still kind of comes through at the end. Uh, John McClane from the Die Hard movies is another great example of a guy who's <laughs> a hero, but yeah, he's yeah. always, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he comes, you know, he, he gets the crap kicked out of him, but he comes through good at the end. So I wanted to write a hero like that. So, And that was where Mark Dane came from. Because I wanted to play with, there's a trope that we've always seen in modern day spy thrillers, which is the guy in the van. There's always the guy in the van. Uh, you know what it's like? Yeah. You've got, you got your hero who's the door kicker and the trigger puller. And you see him going into the room and he's shooting bad guys and he goes on the radio and he's like, Okay, I'm going in, right? And it cuts to a dude in the van on a, on a laptop, and he's going, "Okay, there's three guys over there. You know, mm -hmm. I'll hack the system for you, or whatever, right?" The tech guy in the van, yeah. The tech guy, right? The tech guy in the van. And so I thought to myself, what if the the guy in the van had to do the other guy's job? Yeah, I love it. I, that's something that I always want to see on TV. And that's and that's where Mark Dane came from. You know, he he is he's the guy in the van who gets pushed into the situation. And it was mirroring, I was saying earlier about how I wanted to do something outside my comfort zone. In the story, Mark is outside his comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So he's being pushed into a situation he doesn't want to be in and he has to deal with it. He's on the run, he's being chased by bad guys, he's framed for a crime he didn't commit. He's got to find out who's behind all of these things and he's being pushed further and further out of his comfort zone. But 
but essentially, you know, he's quick, he's smart, he's adaptable, and he's a hero. He's got that kind of moral compass, but he's in over his head. And he's always in over his head. He's always just one step behind and he has to work for every victory that he gets. And that I really, I was really attracted to that idea because I like the idea of someone who has to work for it. And maybe by the end of the story, you know, you, you feel a bit more closely connected to him because you feel like he doesn't get anything handed to him. And that's the, yeah. and so that was the core of the character. So it's a bit of a long winded answer there, Frank, but you know, but that's kind of like where, um, where Mark Dane came from. No, no, I, I mean, like that, that's illuminate. Like it makes me want to go, go yeah. back to the series because I'm, you know, I tend to be, the, you know, the, the, the skinny guy who knows all about the tech and there's always the heroes. I'm always watching it going, I identify with the guy in the van, you know, but as you know, oh. personally, it's like, well, I also have these sword skills and these stunt skills. It's like, I would, I want to see the guy break out of the van when it goes yeah. wrong, not be rescued. And I think I think they also did it in um, I think they gave uh, oh, uh, one of the characters um, in uh, Fast and Furious. They, you know, there's a few of us out there that all feel the same way because he was the tech guy. He was always at our like a rake of computers. But then there's one situation where the bad guys find him and it cuts away. It's like oh shit, they're here, and he has to get off comms and finish. You know get the code going or whatever like that and it cuts away and you're like oh shit he's going to be kidnapped he's going to be in a body bag later you know or he's going to be the 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 um the hostage for them to go and save and then they cut back to him and no he has his own fist fight and he beats the shit out of them and he's like i've got work to do or something like that and he goes back yeah. to it gets back in the van he's like i've dealt with that you know so yeah we need we need we need a lot more of of, of that type type of thing going there's another question here from uh Anne. And uh, where is it gone? Oh, um, so and I, I, you know, I'm interested in this because one of the things um, I'm uh, I'm really rubbish at. Now, I've written personally. I've written a couple of plays. I've had them performed in the states. I've written scenes for movies to fill in plot holes and stuff like that. I have so many ideas. Um, but what advice would you would, uh, um, of of would you give to a budding writer starting out trying to make their way? What what is it? Write a page a day. Doesn't matter how shite it is. Whether you throw it in the trash, just write something. Is is that's what, that's good. that's definitely good advice. I mean, um, the advice I give to everybody who wants to be a writer is is finish finish it. Mm -hmm. it's a lot of time, uh, like new writers will say to me, oh, I started work on a thing." I got a little bit way in. I didn't think it was that good, so I stopped doing it, and I started writing another thing, and I, I didn't finish it. And, and and so what you end up with is is a lot of unfinished things. Mm -hmm. And um, if you never stick the landing, you know it's like you, you're never going to know how good a pilot you are, right? This is the, the analogy I always lose, use is say like if you're a if you're a plumber or a baker, you don't half plumb in the toilet, you don't half bake the cake. You know, you have to finish it, right? And you might get to the end of it and go, that pipe's leaky, that cake don't taste that great. But mm -hmm. you, you, once you finish the thing you're working on, even if you get to the end of it and you go, that's not that good, the fact that you can make that judgment means that you have leveled up a little bit in, in your skill because you need to be able to look at your own work with a critical eye. And every time you finish a thing, you're earning XP, right, to slowly mm -hmm. level up. To what you're doing if you don't finish if you don't land it you never kind of get that skill point you know you never get to sort of be better at what you're doing and you're only ever going to be somebody who's kind of just playing at doing this so i always say like if you've got an idea go all the way through to the end finish it because you will be a better writer at the end and so, so you know and, and your point there as well also like you know and just keep writing the other, the other piece of advice i always give is i say that writing is it's like a muscle it's and if you exercise it, it gets stronger. And if you don't, it gets flabby and it atrophies. So keep writing. Find a little time in your day, even if it's just say you know you get on Sunday morning. You go, I've got a couple of hours before the kids wake up. I'll just noodle around. I'll write a couple of thousand words if I can. You do that. You know, if you could do a thousand words every Sunday, by the end of the year, you've got a novel. So that's all it takes. Just find that little space. Just keep writing, just keep improving because it's incremental. That's how you build your skill. 
when you, when you're writing sorry jim your 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 internet's just a bit garbled there don't know if that's just my end or 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 uh, it's it's your end but anyway um how do you know when you're making when you're doing a conversation between two characters obviously it's just you and your head uh, how do you know you've made the right decision for that scene or the right decision to to make the story move along i mean how often do you write like two chapters and then go off oh, fuck that that's just the wrong way and then go write a different angle how do you like the, i find myself when i try and write something unless i'm doing fill in a plot hole or there's a section of a story that needs to be done um just to i want to know what that character's up to just for that moment you know how do you know you've made the the right decision usually um i try to make as many of those questions get rid of them before i start writing so i you know plot a lot so plot your story first you know don't just sit there and just start writing some people mm -hmm. Some people, that is their process. I won't say, you know, if that's what works for you as a writer, then that you go ahead and you do that. But for me personally, I will look at a scene and go, well, okay, what's the content of this scene? Where do I want to enter the scene? Where do I want to leave? What is the information that is vital that needs to be put across to the audience? I ask myself all those questions. And it's only when I have the shape of it in my head that I actually start writing. So I already kind of know where I'm going to end. I've got that roadmap before before I start up and I always try to uh, a great piece of advice that I've heard um, from a, a, a screenwriter friend of mine is uh, C. Robert Cargill who worked on uh, the Doctor Strange movies and Sinister and a lot of great really horror movies he, he often talked about how the scenes that he thinks are the, the best are the ones that do two things at once mm. and that's something that I definitely try to do so you know if you've got two characters talking about you know, if it's two guys in a car going, well, you know, okay, we're going to drive down here. We're going to go to the drive-in burger place. We're going to get a cheeseburger, and then we're going to go down there, and we're going to get, uh, you know, that, and we're going to go meet this person. And you're, you're you're telling the audience where these characters are going and what they are doing. That's one thing. Can you write that in a way that tells you something about the characters? Mm -hmm. So now you're you're giving the you're giving the reader, the viewer, information, but you're also saying, and he's this kind of guy. Because it's like if you look at the remember the Royale with cheese scene in uh, in Pulp Fiction, mm -hmm. where they're talking about like you know what what do they call a Big Mac in, in in France? You know, it's the Royale with cheese, and these guys are just talking about something that seems completely unrelated to the story, but we're learning about their character, and we're getting a sense of who they are while the story is being moved from one location to another. That scene's doing two different things. And that's an important sort of talent to, to, to learn because that way you can kind of slip information in and you don't make it obvious you're telling your audience something. You just build it into the sort of structure and the weave of the world. Yeah. Nods and winks. Um, yeah. um, different, different, just layering it up. And of course, you know, and, and that's that's something I love. Uh, another, uh, another uh, not so much an author, but he is an author because he's written graphic novels and other st stuff. Um, but Joss Whedon was was amazing at that. He'd be talking about something mundane, but he's actually really getting to the crux of, of the matter and someone figuring out, you know, you'd be, you could be tra talking about the cheeseburger, but the cheeseburger is actually talking about the different layers of your, you know, the, the interconnections and the layers of your family with different flavors. And, you know, mm -hmm. you, it's, there's amazing things that we do. Um, Frank, there's another question there from uh, yes. Anne What do you think is uh, the future of sci-fi writing? Are you optimistic for it? Yeah, I mean, wow. There's, um, what a great time to be a fan of science fiction. I mean, because in terms of, um, there's, there's so much great content out there right now, not just in terms of like uh, the TV and movies. I mean, even just, just to start with that, what a great time to be a fan of Star Trek or Marvel comics or, or anything. You know, there's there's tons of, of, of nerd adjacent stuff out there in the film and TV world that we're getting to see. Uh, and then in terms of prose writing, uh, there's there's this whole new generation of, of science fiction and fantasy writers coming up. Uh, you know, young people with a kind of fresh perspective on stuff, people from different backgrounds, different diverse voices just kind of filling up the the, the, the publishing, uh, the, the bookshelves. Uh, it's just so many, so many great things coming up. It's, it's hard to know where to start. It's like a kind of, um, it's this great buffet of cool stuff. 
you know, it's uh, it's this embarrassment of riches, right? I walk into a bookstore now and I see names I don't recognize and it's exciting because I'm not seeing people who, oh, I know what that guy writes. Oh, yeah, I like that stuff. Oh, I don't know. Like, I don't like that guy's stuff. I see names I don't know. And it's like, wow, what's this going to be? Is this a new, this going to be my new favorite writer? This going to be my new favorite series? Because there's so much, um, you know, opportunity out there and so many new writers coming up. So it really is a great time, I think, to be a fan because there's so much, so much good new content. Um, it's it's not like I, I remember when when I was younger, pre pre sort of TNG times, the kind of the you know the dark times when when you know we, we weren't getting any more Star Trek or Star Wars movies, and it, it felt like everything we were seeing was kind of this holdover from the 1970s when there was like this kind of dearth of ideas. And then we get into the 80s and there's this explosion and reinvigorating of the of the genre. And I feel like we're getting something like that now. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I think it's good. I'm very, very optimistic about it. So like there's there, there's obviously there's different trends. Um, so in the 80s, um, like one of the things I talk about when I'm talking TV with, with colleagues and stuff like that, if you look at the heroes of the 80s, Almost every one of the iconic uh, heroes was uh, had served in the Vietnam War, hmm. you know, or was some, like so. He had the the A team, uh, you know. They 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 were they were ground pounders. Uh, Magnum, he was in naval intelligence in Vietnam. Uh, Michael Knight, he'd served in in Nam. Um, they never really kind of went into it with MacGyver, but in MacGyver season one, he worked for the special. He worked in special forces, you know, so he could he could have easily have served. Um, so, but there was all this, um, the nasty, nasty stuff had happened, but the eighties was trying to write a lot of altruistic, optimistic TV. And we, and out of that, we got the next generation, which is, you know, kind of the ultimate altruistic, uh, uh TV. And, you know, we're a nostalgia guy. I still watch it today. And I watched a couple of episodes today and you still happily watch it. It's just got a style to it that you're like, it doesn't age as badly as some other contemporary things but now since babylon so not, babylon 5 did a great story arc and jms he drew on so many different things uh and referenced so many things via imagery and storylines in the 90s but then in the noughties galactica um took everything into the new modern binge worthy arc storyline but into a darker realm which has hung around for a long time so we're influenced now by, you know, there's the Zack Snyder stuff in the DC universe, making, you know, the altruistic hero of Superman very much darkened down. Uh, and then we have, you know, a lot of TV shows are all the boys looking at the very, like the negative aspects and the more real aspects of what it would be to have those superhero powers and stuff. Do you think we're going to go uh, like, and even, yeah, you know, Discovery takes a darker, dimmer view of, of the Star Trek universe for a, a lot of it, not all of it now, but a lot of it. And Picard is not that uh, bright and optimistic on a, on a happy ship either. Where do you see science fiction going now since we've gone past that? Galactica has made science fiction, dark science fiction popular. We're on that thread now. Do you think it's going to pick up, or where do you see it going now? The thing about TV and movie SF is it tends to be like kind of 10 to 20 years behind where prose writing science fiction is. So if you look at like contemporary space opera right now, a lot of the stuff is is quite hopeful and upbeat. You know, you're, you're seeing stuff crews of ships who are kind of like, you know, instead of fighting some grim conspiracy, it's like a bunch of people traveling around the galaxy looking to have fun. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a lot more upbeat. It's more kind of, um, it's more in the wheelhouse of like, you know, Star Wars or Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a little bit more sort of in, in that sort of direction. And I think, you know, the TV and movie sci-fi is, is a couple, is a decade or so behind. So I think the, the pendulum will swing back the other way is, you know, you look at the you look at the Marvel shows. The Marvel shows and Marvel movies tend to have like there's a kind of dark shading in there, but ultimately, what those stories are about are about good people trying to do good things, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're about they're about a hopeful thing. And I think that's the kind of the bellwether for this. Is I think we we're moving back the other way now. We're gonna I think we're gonna see more sort of hopeful stuff. We're gonna see more forward looking, more um, you know, because the world's gone. We've we've gone through in the real world, you know. 
uh, a dark time for a lot of people where we've, there's been a lot of negativity in the world around us. And people tend to look for entertainment that reflects the opposite to the world that they're living in. Mm -hmm. So when, when, everything's, when everything's good and people are feeling okay about themselves, they feel more ready to kind of look at a darker place and consider darker things. But when you're facing the idea of like lockdown and COVID or, you know, sort of a political circumstances and uncertainty and those kind of things, you don't want to see that reflected in your entertainment as well. You want yeah. to see something that's a little bit more hopeful that speaks to the better angels of our nature. So I think, you know, the, the, I think that, you know, the, 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 the thing's going to go back the other way now because we're, we've done the dark stuff. We're going to go back towards the light now. There's one more question there, Frank, um, yeah. from, from Antoinette. Oh. I could be, well, if I could be a character in one of my books, who would it be? Um. Well, I wouldn't want to be one of my own characters because um, they're not me, right? So, I mean, some of, all of my characters are, there's a bit of me in them, um, but not all of my characters come out of the stories well, you know, a lot of them die horribly. So <laughs> I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would like to share the, share the world with them. I'd like to. I like the idea of, of maybe being a, a Starfleet officer, but not on not on some like big ship of the line like the Enterprise. I'd be happier on like maybe in a lower decks kind of style ship that's like not kind of getting into lots of trouble every week, but kind of cruising <laughs> around looking at cool stuff. Like going, oh, a nebula, oh, a jellyfish, oh, a giant green hand. That's cool. I, I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't want to be serving on the ship where it's like, oh my god, we're being attacked by the Borg again. Oh, we've gone through a time warp. Oh, everybody's been duplicated. You know, we're we're doing all these crazy things. I would be happy to be in a kind of more sedate Starfleet posting. I think. All right, Frank. Is there any? Is there any more questions? So we're going to wrap up now in a few minutes. Jim, Jim, Jim's got to go now. Eight o'clock. So. Got a few more minutes. If you have uh, any more questions out there, guys, uh, stick them in the comments. Uh, we'll try and get through them. Frank, have you any questions there? Yeah, I'll just read through some of the comments here. Um, we've done Anne's one there. Let's see. I think yeah. we've answered everybody's yeah, I think questions. I think we've answered everybody's questions. Yeah, yeah. Which is, which is great, you know. And, uh, well, I mean, just, uh, just on that, uh, Jim, the... Yeah. You know, we've got uh, Thor, uh, Blood and Thunder, was it uh, Love and Thunder, and then you've got uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three, and they're all very, very colourful and bright and optimistic and stuff. How do you think Mar Marvel has been doing versus the movie versions of DC? Because DC on TV has been doing really well, but DC in the movies hasn't done very well at all. That's kind of weird, isn't it? You know, the, the DC in the DC movies, it's like they don't seem to really know how to kind of exploit these great characters mm -hmm. and the, the people making the tv shows you know that it's like Greg Berlanti, you know, yeah yeah you know, you know you've got like what like arrow supergirl star girl legends you know all of these shows have been going from multiple and a flash of course you know all these shows have been going for multiple seasons and ticking along quite nicely and building up a, a really great sort of world you know that shared universe they're doing they're doing this the same thing in dc tv land that marvel are doing with the movies, yeah, it seems like uh, it just seems like DC can't. I, I mean, you know, there was this recent announcement I just saw about how, um, you know, they're they're talking about casting a uh, black Superman, and you know, yeah. and everybody talks about like kind of you know changing the race of a character. That's immediately it's a big red flag for a lot of people, and it creates massive amounts of, of uh, of sort of uh, confusion and anger and stuff. Mm -hmm. And and I thought, and as I as I saw that breaking, I was thinking, you know, they're there's so many great characters. It's not that that isn't a great idea, but there are so many great characters in the DC universe. Mm -hmm. And we keep going back to the same well. We keep going back to, you know, it's 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 the, the sort of like, it's Batman, it's Superman. Recently, we've seen sort of other characters in like the Justice League movie. We finally got a good Wonder Woman movie. Yeah. But I, but I look at, the, I look at the, the, the heroes that turn up in the DC movies and I, and I ask myself, why do they just have so few of them? Whereas you look at the heroes who are turning up in the Marvel movies, every Marvel yeah. movie is like a, a stepping stone to another thing. It's every time we see a Marvel thing, it's introducing three or four more new characters. Yeah. yeah. Like diverse, interesting characters from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, 
And Marvel just seems to be going, hey, we've got this and this and this and this. And they're kind of fanning out these cards, this big deck of cards, and each card is a new character. And yet it seems like with the DC movies, they're always kind of looking in inward looking. They're not expanding the world. Let's reboot again, reboot again. It's almost yeah. like Spider-Man until they got Spider-Man back into the Marvel Universe. It was, oh, those two, that second movie didn't do as well as the first, reboot it again. Yeah, you know, we've been playing catch up. Like when DC have been with playing catch up to Marvel from the very beginning, like you know, so instead of saying, okay, well, we're going to take the time and we're going to, you know, we're going to do a Superman movie and a Batman movie and a Flash movie and you know, and introduce the characters before getting to Justice League, they just went, oh, let's just do Justice League. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, did a couple of Superman yeah, and yeah. Superman and Batman, but you know, your first introduction to Wonder Woman and Aquaman and the Flash is in Justice League. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, so they didn't take that. They did it backwards. Just, obviously, they were trying to catch up. They were fighting the release of the Avengers, though. That was that yeah. was a lot. Of That's it. Right? Well, they're doing ensemble, quick QR ensemble. I mean, you know what? What most people kind of forget now is now now we're in we're in Marvel Phase Four, right? We're on the verge of Marvel mm -hmm. Phase Four. But most people forget that. I mean, Iron Man two thousand and eight, right? Was was the movie that even though it wasn't technically the first in Phase One, that was like the the Hulk movie with. Um, Edward Norton. Yeah. Iron Man is kind of the one that people credit as being the one that kind of lit the match yeah. for the uh, for the for the thing. But what most people forget is that Iron Man was like a C-list superhero. He wasn't yeah. a popular character. You know, uh, at speaking as somebody who's been a fan of Iron Man since he was a kid, you couldn't buy Iron Man action figures, right? Because they didn't make them because he wasn't that popular. Who was the popular heroes? It was it was it was the Hulk and it was Spider-Man. They were the popular Marvel heroes. And so Marvel come along and they go, well, you know what we're going to do is we're going to we do a Hulk movie. Everybody knows what the Hulk is. And then we're going to do we're going to bring in this character, Iron Man, who's an important character in the comics. But to most people in the real world, most people didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. And they piecemeal out this kind of sci fi story. And then the next thing they do is they go, OK, we're going to bring Thor in now. And that's a little bit mythological. But even the th first Thor movie is kind of we don't really see a lot of Asgard. It's mostly grounded in the real world. And gradually, little by little, they start to piecemeal out the world and they build and build and build. And then we got the Captain America movie, but it's set. This is a World War II movie with a superhero in it. Okay, so it's not set in the modern world. And all of this stuff starts to build. And then gradually, we get to the point where we go, okay, now we can have an Avengers movie where yeah. we bring all those threads together. And they, you know, they create all these different streams, they bring them together, they go apart, they bring them together. And that model is great. And, yeah. I, and I don't, yeah. I don't understand why DC just haven't gone. Let's just do that. Yeah, it's, yeah. Instead they, of they, like you said, you know, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head when you say it's like they, they constantly trying to reinvent the same characters. How many times do we need to see that origin story? Yeah, I think, it, I think I think with sorry, they they with with this new thing of looking for, um, you know, an African American or or a black Superman, and people are going. Don't make him Kal El. Why make him Kal El? Because there's uh, Steel was the the mm -hmm. character that they got to take the mantle after Superman was killed by Doomsday. Why don't you make? Because Steel has his own story. He's actually got a black person's history. He's not from. He's from Earth, and he's got black issues that they've been looking at in Falcon and Winter Soldier. So why not just do Steel? Because he's already there. He's a character that's supposed to be there, and then you can roll them into what you've got movie-wise already, instead of, again, reinventing the wheel, except, oh, this time we're going to make him a different race. Or, you know, it's 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 a bit like the gender bending of Starbuck and things like that, which is not, it's not, it's not bad, but it's almost like, well, we've, we've changed a couple of characters to females. What else can we do? Oh, let's make them this, make, make them that. But there's characters have been written already. Well, let's explore their stories because they have an expansive story dealing with, their issues that need to be seen. So let's do that. I mean, uh, yeah, you, you know, there's there's uh, there's 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 so many characters from from so many interesting uh, you know ethnic backgrounds, diverse backgrounds that DC have created. Uh, is it um, is it John Stewart, the the Green Lantern character? Mm -hmm. Yeah, John Stewart. Yeah. You know, I mean, like you know, I mean, he's got like fantastic narrative. And and let's face it, the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern wasn't great. You want to reboot something? Reboot Green Lantern. Yeah, because that's got that. There's a lot of amazing possibilities there for a, a sci-fi superhero story. I think they the, they are bringing Green Lantern in, um, but it's going to be a guy. It was Diggle the, from Arrow, right? John Diggle from Arrow. 
No, um, there's another one. There's a guy. Uh, what's his name? Guy. He was the cop. He wears the leather jacket. Because there's four, uh, there's four human lanterns. There's there's Hal Jordan, and uh, then there's Kyle Rayner, who's the artist. John Stewart, and then there's there's Guy. I keep wanting to say Guy Gisborne, but that's, that's Guy Gardner. That's, 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 right? that's, that's, yeah. Guy Gardner. Guy Gardner. So the next one's going to be Guy Gardner, and I'm like, why not you do John Stewart? Because you could have been set up in, in easily in in Arrow with with uh, that that character. Well, it's um. Just it's, like, before we go, you know, uh, one last question there. Uh, I was looking to know if you have any hints on what's coming up from you in the future. I know you were telling me uh, before when we crashed uh, something about uh, coming up for you. If you want to just reiterate that to the guys okay. there. The uh, yeah, the next thing, uh, next Star Trek project I've worked on, which is just currently going through edits, is um, the Ashes of Tomorrow, which is. Book two in a miniseries called Star Trek Coda. So three book miniseries written by myself, David Mack, and Dayton Ward. That's going to be coming out towards the end of this year. And uh, I can't say a lot about, about, about it because we're, we're all sworn to secrecy. But it's going to be a big, huge, mega epic set in the Star Trek literary timeline. And it's going to shake things up. And by the end of it, nothing's going to be, nothing will be the same by the end of it. We're doing a big, big, big change. Wow. I like the sound of that. Don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're fine. You're in, you're, in, you're in a Picard novel, so you're in a separate timeline. You're all you're good. <laughs> because I know, uh, I know that uh, every time you put uh, our, our dear old friend Steve Riley into something, <laughs> Steve has to die. I stopped, yeah. I stopped doing that because he got very upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Well, I remember one of his main characters was you wrote the, uh, you wrote the Xbox Battlestar Galactica game. And had him in there as Rilo, uh, who dies epically in a fireball. Yeah, he, crashes his, he crashes his Viper into a crater, you know. As Steve <laughs> said to me, that he said, oh, you didn't see a body, he could still be alive. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, look, Jim, um, thanks very much for, for doing this interview. Um, oh, very much appreciate it. I've really enjoyed this. This is actually, it's, 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 we don't get to sit in the bar and chat um, about these things, but it's yeah. been, been amazing to, to talk, you know. Um, right. well, listen, guys, I wanted to say thank you so much for having me here. It's it's just fun to chat about nerd out and talk about geeky stuff. And also, um, I want to say a big thank you to Anne and everybody else who asked such really great questions as well. It's um, it's I, I love talking about my stuff. You know, I love to talk about writing because it's great and I'm so passionate yeah. about it. And um, you know, just to share it with everybody is you know I'm I'm a fan just as much as all of you guys are. And, you know, if there's anybody out there who, who wants to write, uh, feels like they could be a writer, I'm living proof that you can go from being a fan to being a professional. So, you know, uh, hold on to your dreams, write hard, keep writing, and good luck. Great. Thanks so much. I know for myself, I'm going to be looking forward to checking out the Sundowners because it's, 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 it's something that's right down my alley. So now that I'm aware of it, yeah, I think you'll have it read in, a, in less than a week, Frank. You'll just <laughs> chomp through those Sundowner books. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the problem like that? It's like I just cannot put the Kindle down or the book down. I just like, okay, yeah. that's it. Nothing else is getting my attention until I finish reading this. Like, you know? So, guys, um, go on to uh, like Amazon or Book Depository and just type in Jim's name, James Swallow. And I think there's like five pages of novels. Yeah. And there's a big thing we didn't get through today. And I know Morgan Dean's going to be a bit. Uh, miffed because he wasn't in the comments, but Morgan Dean is a huge fan of all your Warhammer uh, stories, uh, the Blood Angels and uh, all those stories that you've, you've written for Games Workshop. He loves those. So oh, you know, if you, if you if you ever need uh, if you ever need a, a character name for one of them, Dean Sergeant Dean of the Blood Angels or something like that. D E A N E. He'll get eaten by orcs and die horribly. By or, you know, like his, hair, his head torn off by Gene Steeler or something, you know. And listen, uh, if anybody out there has like uh, any other questions for me, you know, you can always find me um, at JM Swallow on Twitter. Or if you want to check out my website, which is easy to remember, it's just jswallow.com. Uh, you know, I, I got a blog up there and everything about like all the stuff. It's you want to know anything about my writing, it's all right there. That's it. That's awesome. great. Let me see if I can pull that up just because here we go. Um, if it'll load, there we go. So, uh, yeah, there's Jim's website. There we go. There's all this, there's all this current stuff. Watchdogs, Phantom Covert Ops, 
There's his Twitter. You can follow him on Twitter. There's all the latest ones. Ghost from the uh, the, the the Mark Dane series. You know, so yeah, BAFTA. Uh, you know, so all these things and all these awards and uh, New York bestseller, Jim Swallow, Jim, Jim Swallow, James Swallow. Thank you so much. Thanks, for guys. Us. Appreciate it, Jim. Have a good one. Thanks so much, man. Bye bye. Take it easy.